Hi, this is Tintin from Invictus Education, and today we're going to go over some, well not some, but one IB history topic. Let's start with something close to my heart, the First World War. Let's talk history. So the Great War from 1914 to 1918 was known as one of the most deadly conflicts in human history because of its uh, bloodshed, its futility, and all the romanticized warfare of the Edwardian era. It's kind of the melting pot and the starting point for all political turmoil and all, well, types of future wars in the 20th century following. But instead of talking about uh, all the uh, political and social aspects that you most IB students would talk about in their papers, let's make this interesting. I'd like to talk more about the weapons and the technological aspect and development over the course of the war. The technological stuff shows how um, influential World War One is. So let's start with, well, ships. So you might be asking me, oh, ha, but isn't the world war fought on land and all that kind of stuff? Well, aha, my friend, you are half right. You had Jutland and, well, Falkland Islands at the time, and Hugo, he, he, Hugo and Blyde and whatever. But we have to look at the arms race as a little bit of a precursor to the war. It's also technological stuff. Also technological stuff. I apologize for my speed. To illustrate my point, here is a model of the USS Arizona that I got at a lovely toy exhibition a couple weeks back. Now, Arizona is related to Dreadnought in a way that she is a super Dreadnought. Look at this model anyway. Look, the guns even turn and you can elevate the guns. But that's not the point. The term that I used, super Dreadnought. Every ship built after Dreadnought was known as a Super Dreadnought, and every, dread every ship built before Dreadnought was known as a Pre-Dreadnought. Damn you, Jackie Fisher, for creating such an awesome... Wait, that's pretty good, actually. You can see what I mean. Oh, look at them big guns. It's a huge main armament and a couple of secondaries and thick armor at the side. You see what I'm trying to illustrate here? Dreadnought was revolutionary. She was powered by steam turbines. She was the fastest ship in the world. Fastest capital ship, I mean. Sorry, I rephrased that. She had an all main gun battery of 10 12 inch guns instead of the previous 4 12 inch guns plus the 9.2 inch secondaries of the pre-dreadnoughts and whatnot. She had such a powerful um, armament that basically she literally declared she basically rendered every other battleship in the world obsolete so i put down arizona here and i'll talk about why the royal navy wanted to still be the best in the world because the british empire was still a thing and britannia still ruled the wave so dreadnought's development basically caused everybody to start building more and more things and more and more ways to kill people so uh dreadnought could do 21 knots she had 19 inches of belt armor she had a couple of secondaries but mostly her 10 12 inch guns were very very impressive um this would be a running up to jutland and all that kind of all those kinds of things arizona was built after jutland i think or was she well she was built during the first world war but she was known for blowing up at anchor and pearl harbor when the japs bonded in 1941 yeah, a bit insensitive there, but it's history. So now we move back to the land, and let us start with 1914 at the Battle of Mons. When Britain entered the war on the 23rd of August 1914, they knew they were in for a tough time because the various conscript armies, basically everybody in the world had a conscript army, they preferred conscript armies rather to the professional standing army that the Brits had to use to garrison the empire. Unfortunately, those conscript armies were pretty huge, like millions of men. Britain only had a standing army of like 200,000 or something, or less than that actually. So. The run-up to war was very, very, very um, important at the time. The British Expeditionary Force was armed with, I think, two Vickers machine guns per battalion or division. It was very rubbish. But every single man was armed with my favorite rifle in the world, the Lee Enfield. Ten rounds and a very, very efficient and fast bolt system. 
they could do the mad minute every british serviceman was trained to do the mad minute or at least attempt to do the mad minute which was 15 rounds a minute 15 rounds a minute at a target 200 yards away and they would all hit all aimed and they would all just pepper the target and turn it into swiss cheese it's very impressive this professional training managed to decimate the German ranks at the Battle of Mons when the Germans advanced in massed parade ground formation, just carrying the rivals and they just got shot to pieces by the Brits. This is the majority accepted notion and as an IB student you must remember, please cross check your sources, there are two sides of the story. I actually did Mons for my uh, history extended essay. You have two sides of the story, you have Mons in which the majority accepted the notion in which the Brits decimated the Germans and then you have the revisionist uh, side of things in which they think the Germans did not suffer that many casualties and were not advancing in parade ground formation as per uh, the majority accepted notion is. Oh no, Arizona's crane at the back of the seaplane is coming loose. Rifles versus old Napoleonic line tactics of mast advancing towards the enemy before setting down and then shooting the crap out of them. That doesn't really work well. New technology, well not new, but pretty much modern technology and old antiquated tactics with the invention of rifling and the fact that rifles were no longer muskets which you needed RNGs Jesus to kind of hit anything at 50 meters. You basically had to develop at the uh, at the start of the war nothing of that sort happened which brings us to the stalemate after the end of mobile warfare because both armies could now kill each other at unprecedented rates casualties were high and uh, they decided to dig in it worked but once you dig in you don't really want to come out do you so we advance into the stalemate years of late 14 and early 15. 1915 saw the rise of uh, chemical warfare and saw the first mast, mast amphibious uh, landings at Gallipoli. Yeah, it was a pretty shit year to be honest. <laughs> Going over the top was starting to become a thing as trench networks became more and more intensive and more and more deep. However, the Germans and the Brits both tried to break the stalemate in which the Germans used poison gas, mustard gla gas, chlorine gas, phosgene, ow, phosgene gas, and various types of deadly chemicals that were spread across the battlefield. Poison gas was pretty effective in the way that when it was first used, no one knew what the hell it was except that it was deadly. You breathed it and you started to burn and ache like hell, and then suddenly you died. It was very scary at the time. But later, as the war progressed, gas masks were invented, but it started off with actually people pissing into a handkerchief and using ammonia to kind of block the smell and block the gas and everything, and I reacted with it. Gas masks were invented, respirator boxes, as we see at the end of the war coming about. Uh, it really started the development in terms of um, combat and chemical and maybe even biological warfare, so it was pretty influential at the time. But one drawback of poison gas is that you need favorable winds. The Germans and the Brits found out both the hard way when the winds blew in the opposite direction so the gas blew back into their own trenches and even to the reserve. That did not produce good effects but it did produce a lot of diarrhea let's put it this way. Then we come to Gallipoli which was the first masked amphibious landings or invasion. The Brits tried to go up the Dardanelles straight to cut off the supplies to the Ottomans and secure a supply uh, route to Russia to help them on the Eastern Front against the Germans. Winston Churchill thought it would work, but he thought, eh, nothing can defeat the Royal Navy and the Anzacs and the Royal Marines and the Middlesex Regiment and whatnot. Well, the coastal guns actually worked, my friend. The Ottomans were camped out on, the decision, on their positions. They were fighting a defensive... Um, campaign basically and as history proves actually defensive campaigns most of the time they work better than offensive campaigns because you get to prepare and stock up and you have something to protect you and you're not the opposing offensing or advancing enemy in which you have to go through obstacles and cover open ground to, and get shot at all the time the Australians and New Zealanders suffered heavily for it. the Anzacs the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps they have suffered heavily for that but through that blood and fire and warfare, they formed their own national spirit and identity. They came out strong, they came out on top, and they banded together and fought finally for the first time as an independent unit. Cheers to them. Good day, mate.
And I've probably just offended so many Australians and New Zealanders. Oh. Moving on to the uh, grim years of 1916, in which stereotypical World War I happened. 1916 saw battles such as Verdun, and of course, most infamously, the Somme. And with it came the rise of armoured warfare and the start of air power. Air power was used to scout the battlefields, and tanks first appeared on the trenches of France. And helmets for the British Army were quite a thing. To illustrate my point again, I will now wear this. This is a Mark II steel helmet. This is, in all, for all intents and purposes, similar to the Mark I steel helmet of 1916. It's basically the same thing but with a shorter like brim and a different liner and a different chin strap and uh, slightly more round I guess, less flatter kind of crap shell or something. But to all intents and purposes this is the iconic uh, British helmet of both the first and second world wars. Now to understand why I'm wearing this we have to talk about artillery and why such death and devastation needed a stalemate. If you look at Verdun and the Somme, all like hundreds of thousands of casualties over the course of this like campaign for the Somme alone I think the Brits suffered like 65,000 casualties alone on the first day that is horrifying Jesus um yeah first 24 hours or something most of the deaths on the western front were caused by not machine guns or rifles as one would expect by artillery so the Brits had to issue this helmet Contrary to what people and the soldiers at the time believed, they were not bulletproof. You get shot through this, you will die. Unless it was a pistol caliber sized bullet, then at like 50, 100 meters, you could deflect it. But other than that, you will most certainly die. You see the shape, it's a, it's a bowl shape. It's to protect from shrapnel coming down on top. It's pretty good, isn't it? It's not to deflect from the front. It's not to protect from the front like the French Adrians and the German, like Stahlhelm, the close couple helmets. Uh, they were to protect from shrapnel and all debris coming down from the top. And it did work. It saved a lot of soldiers' lives after that. Uh, and this kind of shows how how much warfare has kind of developed already within these two years. We started the war with rifles. We now, end, we now continue the war with heavy, heavy bombardments. And we've gone through poison gas. We've gone through like the horrors of trench warfare. Hundreds of thousands of casualties. This stalemate was required to be broken, so the Brits came up with the land ship, or as we know it, the tank. I don't have a model of the tank, unfortunately. The tank first saw use at the Battle of the Somme, but unfortunately many of them broke down, and not many got to the front lines, but they did, like, give a psychological impact. The Germans thought they were beasts, because you have this armored box lumbering towards you, and suddenly, oh my god, it has machine guns. It cuts through barbed wire, it can withstand maybe one hit from, one or two hits from an artillery shell, but if it directed, then you're a goner, as we know from Battlefield 1. Ha ha ha. Yeah, play that game, it's actually quite nice. It's not necessarily historically accurate, but it's pretty fun. Or you could play Verdun, the game, I mean. It's, it's basically Armor 3 for World War 1. Go check it out, it's pretty good. I play that as well. You can hit me up on Steam, Lee Enfield Law. That's my gamer type. Please, uh, we're, we're straying too far. So let's go back to Abbey for a little bit. So, the Battle of the Somme saw the tank come in. Many of them broke down. But it was it was an effective stalemate. It was an effective thing. You had an armored box that protected your machine guns. Unfortunately, conditions inside the tank were very dead because you have like 53 degrees Celsius because the engine was literally in the middle. Eight fighting men in an armored box. You would smell all day. And the fumes would suffocate people and carbon monoxide poisoning would kill you. So it was kind of, kind of hell for the men themselves. Jutland came around in 1916, 31st of May to 1st of June, I think. I don't remember. The first... And probably one of the last battles in which the hopeful, uh, what the, 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 the dreamt battle of all lines of like big gun capital ships facing off. British battle cruisers blew up, as per the famous quote by Beatty, I think, if I remember. What? There's something wrong with our, something wrong with our bloody ships today. Yeah, you guys use battle cruisers as frontline ships to tank hits like other battleships with real thick armor can do you utter twit let's move on to 1917 with uh well the canadians i guess 1917 saw the um penultimate year of the war with uh 
this peak of trench warfare, American involvement, and Russia pulling out of the war. By this time, the war had been going on for three years. Everybody was tired and weary, but they still had to fight. You have the advance in automatic fire, so you had, instead of divisional machine guns, you now had um, portable machine guns, light machine guns at the um, platoon or a company or even platoon level you had Lewis guns the Brits had Lewis guns the French had the Hotchkiss the Germans had some sort of lightened variant of the MG08 I think the MG08 MA15 or something the advancement in portable fire made the death toll rise even higher because not only now are you trapped in the mud and soil and death of France and Flanders but now you get to die even quicker because everybody now has even more automatic weapons which is kind of a bad thing if you're in the trenches and you're about to go over the top straight into no man's land that's not what you want is it the Canadians kind of paid the ultimate sacrifice but also again just like the Australians and the Zinders in 1915 they forged their own national identity with Vimy Ridge and Passchendaele those two battles are very famous in Canadian history and in military history and they do kind of display the ferocity and the, the spirit, the Canadian spirit as the Canadian Corps just went up against the Germans. That's really admirable. Brave men, very brave men. Hand-to-hand -hand combat was brutal in the trenches with grenades and uh, trench clubs and fragging and imp uh, not fragging, that was Vietnam. Like improvised weapons in which you would just randomly club the enemy and just destroy all of his. It. it was very brutal at the time. Then the Russians pulled out of the war, unfortunately. The Brusilov Offensive, the Germans were kind of successful at it, then the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk in which socialist R Russia got taken over by the Bolsheviks then they pulled out of the war and then they turned communist later in 22 shame on them anyway the Americans joined the war and this is what makes it so interesting not I prefer the Brits though but the fact that Germany was alarmed because unrestricted submarine warfare and the sinking of the Lusitania and the Americans with all the fresh strong millions of fresh strong troops projected to come over once war was declared you know Germany's in big big trouble so they decided to launch their own last offensive the Ludendorff offensive the hundred days offensive uh, Germany's 100 days as it's known or other I don't know, other uh, in Wikipedia and stuff. Americans brought with them more automatic weapons, more rifles and much more artillery, let's put it this way. Although in the first year they did have to steal from the like take from the French and the Brits because they were kind of short. But when the Americans were in full force, you know not to mess with America. Look at what's happening in the Middle East and World War II and what else. They're, they're pretty strong. And combined armed strategy also saw it start at this time. Air power was getting more and more powerful with like the Red Baron and all the dogfighting and um, scouting for the infantry and bombard the rise of bombers, the Hadley Page bomber, and with like fighters such like the Sobworth Camel and the Germans have the Fokker and all that kind of those famous planes and stuff. Combined arms strategy in which um, the infantry doesn't act alone now, the navy doesn't act alone now, the air power doesn't act alone now, they all combine together. For example, if you were fighting on the coast, the navy could provide bombardments first, the infantry could come in and do some fighting, airplanes could bomb and do some scouting or strafing, then the infantry could come and mop up the remains. It was the first in the strategy. It was pretty innovative because at the time both forces just had their own single-minded, single-pattern thinking. But this really shows the development and it shows the scale of industrial warfare as a whole of how we have come from within just a couple of years we've gone from like napoleonic line infantry and cavalry to now big guns industrial warfare automatic self-loading rifles and machine guns it's it's a pretty substantial development then let us talk of 1918 in which we see the biggest leap in technology germany especially they had stormtroops armed with submachine guns new at the time the mp18 they had the wax flamethrower, oh that was deadly, and you had saturation bombardments by, to, to just pound the enemy, and you had hurricane bombardments to, re, to just literally just a, intense, just I cannot describe, like millions of shells can be fired within like a short period of time to 
just destroy enemy morale, pound the enemy defenses into submission, and hope to soften up the enemy, then follow in with automat portable automatic weapon armed troops like the submachine gun armed storm troops, flamethrowers, grenades, shorter carbines, rifles, and then just storming in to clear the allied trenches, then break punch a line through, punch a hole through, and then infiltrate, and then follow with another wave of normal infantry. That was really, really innovative. Another thing to note, it's not in the book, but um, it's worth it's worth knowing, uh, Billy Mitchell, the father of US Air Force, it, it was called at the time, he actually it, it, he thought about uh, landing paratroopers in 1919, if the war continued that long, he planned to fly British bomb, Handley Page bombers, and slide American troops off them behind German lines. That that if that happened, that would have been the first uh, uh, paratroop paratroop movement ever. That would have been impressive, but uh, yeah, it didn't happen in the end. The war ended. Unfortunately, we see tank to tank warfare in the last few months of the war when the Germans had the A7V going up against a British Mark IV, two Mark IVs, I believe, one male and one female. Uh, in terms of tanks, you have the Brits had invented the Mark I to Mark V tank and armored warfare was on the rise. The, the, the French had the saint Germain tank and most famously FT-17, the first tank in the world with a rotating turret, which was innovative. The Americans came in and took whatever, copied and just took whatever everybody else had left over. Then the Russians just took whatever scraps everybody had to use in their own civil war after they pulled out of the war last year. 1918 was truly, truly uh, the peak, and we see at the time, for the first time in modern history, modern warfare was truly born. No longer was the imperial, colonial, um, skirmishing, flying column mindset ever going to rise again. Now it was the time for combined warfare, armored warfare the rise of air superiority, the rise of automatic and self-loading individual firearms, and most importantly, the artillery got even more deadly and would go on, and all of these would go on to kill more people in the Second World War and even in the wars beyond. And this is why the technological aspect of the First World War is so interesting, because it was truly, those, those ancient romanticized weapons, this truly was the dawn of modern warfare. Thank you for listening, and uh, please consider subscribing down below, and uh, well, I may talk about more IB history stuff, more um, English, I guess, and uh, my other colleagues will come in and teach you more IB subjects. Who knows? Maybe you even get to learn about entrepreneurship tips. Who knows? Subscribe and you will find out more. Yeah, thanks for watching. I hope it wasn't too much of a ramble, and I'll see you next time. I hope if my boss doesn't kick me. Peace out.